Most days when the weather's not garbage, I ride my bike into work. It's only a short ride, but there are still some very interesting phases to it, including a very nice stretch down Smith Street with a very high risk of someone opening their car door into you. Along the main strips you see pockets of shops being opened up and a patchwork of striking but often defective terrace houses and highly functional dystopian new builds. Some of the people exiting these homes for the day look optimistic, some look despondent and most just have that early morning gaze of indifference. Once you land in the central business district you see a few accountants and consultants in suits but most men don't wear suits to the office anymore and most women are more likely to wear faux corporate white sneakers than they are to wear high heels. You see students, hospitality workers, construction and transport workers chipping away at an endless pipeline of infrastructure initiatives. Rail tunnels, skyscrapers, busways and tram shelters. It sounds weird but I love the city during peak hour. It feels familiar but also transient and temporary. It seems to be handing out individual opportunity while also drawing you into something bigger, some broad cohesive unit. But is the city really one broad cohesive unit? Even if you feel it is, which I really do a lot of the time, it doesn't mean we're all participating in the exact same way. Some people definitionally work in an office in the city, but in practice that office has been their bedroom since the pandemic sent them home at the start of 2020. And others now work in industries that are so fragmented that the advantages of being close to your co-workers are minimal, from web design to consulting, to fast food, alcohol or whipped cream delivery services. And after we shut the computer or turn off the electric bike or whatever else we use to make money, what do we tend to do now with the other hours left in the day? For some of us those hours don't exist, there's just no time. But even for those of us who do have that spare time, the data would suggest that we're less likely than ever to be engaged with social or civic or community groups. Those groups have much more competition now, the digital substitutes are getting very good. We use the apps on our phone to interact parasocially with the people we look up to and the people we hate. It's all there on Palestine, on Ukraine, on the most recent spate of alleged armed robberies or lousy political decisions. This architecture is double-edged. It gives us exactly what we want. But what if we've come to realise that what we want is very different from what the people all around us want? In my home country, Australia, less than a third of adults under age 34 reported a great sense of belonging in 2023. These numbers are slightly higher for older people, but they've been falling for everyone across all age, demographic and socioeconomic groups. And as our sense of belonging has fallen, so too has our confidence in the institutions around us. The surface level vibrance of the modern major city papers over a darker reality. A reality that the connections between the society and the state have become weaker, along with many of our connections with each other. And this new distance makes us vulnerable. In 1992, Francis Fukuyama infamously said that we'd reached the end of history, with the liberal democratic model being the culmination of a linear Hegelian progression over millennia, to the evolutionary endpoint of human government, its final unchanging iteration reached with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Today, riding a bike through a city centre of a liberal democratic country, it can almost feel like that hypothesis hasn't been disproven yet. But on a closer inspection, it already has, with the isolation, distrust and population that has emerged since 1992 seeing many people turn away from the model entirely. Towards what, we don't really know yet. But to paraphrase the next generation's favourite popular futurist, it would seem that, for now, the end of history has been postponed. Trust is a useful thing to have if you want your economy to function. Banks make money by lending out deposits, but if everyone demands access to their deposits all at once, the banks collapse. This happened across the world during the Great Depression, but it still happens today. In March 2023, a string of US banks collapsed, primarily thanks to an overexposure to the crypto market. Also in 2023, Australia saw both Medibank and Optus suffer information breaches which stole the personal information of nearly 10 million people apiece. That's nearly half of the national population in each case. What unites a crypto-driven bank run with mass data breaches, the polarisation of our politics, the work-from-home revolution and the isolation we all experience through our siloed social media use? The answer is the cause. Technological change which occurred faster than the relevant institutions could adapt. I'm going to look at four shocks which have fundamentally changed how we engage with both the state and with each other. None of which are wholly negative, but none of which we anticipated, and none of which we've worked out how to live with day to day. The first of these, which we've already touched on, is the changing way we now work. The pandemic helped us realise just how many of the jobs we previously undertook face to face have proven to be completely achievable from a bedroom. Marketing, finance, administration, health services even, they've all become increasingly decentralised. 
Today, companies that demand their workers attend the office five days a week are seen as aggressive at best and abusive at worst. I don't mind this at all. I work from home one or two days a week, and I don't know that many people with the option to do that who go in every day still. There's a benefit to staying close to family, being able to do some life admin on your lunch break, and being able to get to the post office before it closes at 5pm on the dot. In Australia, ex-Victorian Premier Jeff Kennett, who incidentally used to buy pizzas from the takeaway joint I worked at while I was in uni, has argued that people who work from home should be paid less. Yet in the same breath, Kennett also states, people have come to realise that working from home saves them a great deal of stress and anxiety. So this reduction in stress and anxiety is a bad thing then, is it, Jeff? Treat them mean, keep them Anyway, just like it took us a while to realise that those electric scooters that have popped up on every street corner are here to stay, working from home in those jobs that allow it isn't going anywhere either. But importantly, as for our politics, as for crash diets or exercise regimes, the weird shit is what takes place at the margins. According to Gallup in the US, only 20% of remote capable workers were fully on site in 2023, down from 60% in 2019. But more extreme is the jump in people who worked completely remotely from 2019 to 2023, which has jumped from 8 to 29%. So nearly a third of remote capable workers are now never making the commute, never meeting a colleague for coffee, never going for a slightly too long lunch, never buying a big issue at the station, and never bonding over the shared horror of a train cancellation. How can you really know your coworker if you never bond over a shit commute? And all of this, so far, just relates to the office dwelling population. But the trend goes well beyond this group. When you think of the gig economy, you probably think of ride sharing through Uber, food delivery through Uber Eats, and odd jobs through Airtasker. These are the bigger fish, but they're now operating in an enormous pond. There are now hundreds of gig platforms operating across care services, photography, graphic and web design, coding, translation, editing, and administration. These platforms appeared for a reason. If large companies are cruise ships with a set course and destination, these platforms are speedboats. They can chop and change, letting supply meet demand at short notice. They make it easier to get a lift, to get a meal, to get a tradie, or to get your picture taken. But for the people in the speedboat, there's less protection when things go wrong. Workers on these platforms aren't paid overtime. They can be fired with no notice and no recourse. They're more likely to experience stress and anxiety, and they're more likely to face abuse and assault at work. Young people are far more likely to be in the gig economy, and men are twice as likely to be working on a gig platform as women. Gig workers are more likely to be disabled, and they're one and a half times more likely to speak a language other than English at home. Temporary residents are three times more likely to be gig workers. When Marx was building his catalogue, the working class were a mass of vulnerable factory workers, making machinery and textiles. They lived in quiet desperation, but it was a quiet desperation of a different quality. Today the working class drive Ubers and do odd jobs for a boss they'll never meet, because their boss is an application. They don't have co-workers, they can't unionise, and they have little opportunity to connect with their community through their work. These platforms are efficient, but they're also faceless and ruthless. They arose through technological progress, as did our ability to work office jobs from home. But the price of this change is fragmentation. A fragmentation which makes the modern workplace a colder, less connected place. Complementing this fragmentation in our working lives, there's been a change in the hours we spend outside work, the change to our civic institutions, the bodies and societies through which we engage with others. People with a sense of belonging in their community are less likely to feel isolated. They're more likely to trust other people. But that sense of belonging is getting harder to achieve, thanks to a decline in community participation, social groups, and civic engagement. In Australia, the Scanlon Monash Index of Belonging has shown a marked decrease since 2007, though the broader phenomenon has been documented for decades. One well-known example is the 2000 book Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam. Putnam measured a decline in aggregate membership across religious groups, labour unions, women's clubs, volunteer organisations, and fraternities. The eponymous finding he used was that over the previous two decades, the number of people bowling in America had increased, but the number of people bowling as part of a league had decreased. More bowling, but bowling alone. Putnam spends a lot of time articulating his supposed causes of this trend, including the growth of two career families due to more women entering the workplace, increased opportunities for physical mobility decreasing a family's ties with any given community, an increase in the urban sprawl creating suburbanisation and physical fragmentation, and technological changes, which have transformed how we spend our leisure time. In 2000, Putnam identified television as the main driver of this, but it seems like we've come a long way from TV being the most addictive form of electronic escapism. Now, 
Just because those things are potential causes, it doesn't mean that they're negatives per se. You're drawing a pretty long bow to suggest that more women staying in the workforce is a societal drain, and I'm not exactly sure that I'd have a good time going bowling with the people drawing that bow. And it's also not as simple as arguing that the television or the iPhone or the ability to be more mobile are explicit negatives. But even so, the issues arise when we don't consider what negatives are eventuating, how these trends have eroded the power of our old mechanisms of engagement with a particularly stark example being the near complete collapse of the union movement. In Australia, the 40 years between 1976 and 2016 saw union membership for all employees fall from 51% to 14%. The industries with high concentrations of union membership, car manufacturing, textiles, printing and transport have all declined, being replaced by the sectors we've mentioned previously, gig work and the like. Changes such as this, from how we organise to whether we join a sporting group, a gym, a yoga class, a pottery class, AA, a book club, whether we volunteer at a soup kitchen or an op shop. Changes such as these are inevitable as the economy evolves. But as things stand, all of these forms of engagement are on the decline, and we haven't found anything to replace them with. We've now touched on the decline in civic institutions, which serve to strengthen a society through the opportunities we have to engage with each other. Meanwhile, our political institutions are what allow the existence of a strong, capable state. They're how we engage with government. And for a nation in the liberal democratic mould to not become shit, it needs both. A strong society to keep the government in check, and a strong enough state to provide the oversight, public goods and services that governments are best placed to provide. To determine whether the latter, our political institutions, are functioning as they should, we can ask a few questions. Are governments using the money we pay through taxes for the right things, for schools and hospitals, for infrastructure and welfare? Are they delivering these services effectively? Are they sound economic managers? Do they go on holiday during a time of crisis? Are the emergency services and the police force effective and fair? Do the courts function? This is hardly a yes or no question over time, right? There's no single measure we can use here, and the partial indicators we have, such as GDP per capita, the unemployment rate, or the inflation rate, operate with lags. Decisions taken by governments carry into the future, and the impacts of individual decisions aren't often seen until years after they're taken. What we can measure, though, is the public's perception of all of this. Public sentiment can be mercurial, the public don't always get it right. But ultimately, in a democracy, their voice is all that matters. I think we can make the general comment that the 2020s, with all of its COVID misadventures, data breaches, bank failures, supply shocks and inflation spikes, saw a few governments across the world pushed to the limits of their capabilities, and in some cases beyond their capabilities. You can see this in the Pew Research Center's data in the US, with trust falling since 2020. But let's zoom out. Hmm. From this, it seems that public sentiment has been tanking not since the pandemic, but since the Johnson and Nixon eras. Was it Vietnam and Watergate that made us realise we couldn't trust our fearless leaders of the free world? Maybe. But a lot of time's passed since then, hasn't it? Trust does rebound marginally during a time of crisis. You see one rebound in 1991, the year of the US-led invasion of Kuwait to kick out Saddam Hussein. You see a similar peak in 2001, thanks to a certain event on America's East Coast, the discussion of which gets YouTubers demonetized. And more recently, the pandemic, where people turned to the government to keep them safe. At home and abroad, people endorsed governments who locked down borders and rolled out stimulus packages. And then after each of these crises, our trust went back down again. Why are we so flaky? Has the game just gotten too hard, perhaps? Who can really protect us from this century's supply shocks in Wuhan, in Ukraine? Who can guarantee safety from modern cyber attacks? Who can guarantee sound employment amidst the automation and fragmentation of so many old industries? Who can trust that our institutions won't misuse this tech themselves, as illustrated in Australia through the countless royal commissions into banking misconduct, institutionalised abuse, and more recently into the robo-debt scheme, which unlawfully issued 470,000 flawed debt recovery notices to the most vulnerable people in the country, some of whom took their own lives as a result. Compounding this is another challenge which has furthered the divide between government and constituency. The economic inequality we've seen rise over past decades. As I've discussed in another video, which you can find in the description, the 70s and 80s was a period of market liberalisation. As competition with Asian manufacturing became untenable and foreign capital flows became more widely accepted, governments in Europe, the Americas and Oceania flattened their tax bases, privatised government corporations, restricted the money supply and opened up labour markets. And largely thanks to these policies, inflation was brought under control, and there was a boom in GDP. International trade exploded, strike action was reduced, and the economies of the neoliberal reformers became more productive, more competitive, and more profitable. The consequence of this, though, which exploded through the surface in 2008, was that not all of the gains of these reforms had been equally shared. Trade liberalisation did nothing per se for American manufacturing, for Australian welfare recipients, 
or for the unions who had guaranteed minimum conditions for workers, but in doing so had made those workers uncompetitive with the countries who could now import cheap goods to consumers with the new freedom to buy them. Not everyone impacted by this joins a protest, but they still see prices rising at the supermarket while their wages stay stagnant. Meanwhile, they see politicians and business people continuing to talk about the measures they're continuing to take to continue delivering results for their constituents, their shareholders and their customers. They see a dissonance in this, and in many cases they determine that the political institutions as they stand are not working for them that the deck has changed and that they haven't been dealt in. In Australia, nearly a third of voters rejected the two major parties in 2022, with that vote dissipating to a mob of independents and minor parties. I've commented on this phenomenon in another video, which you can find in the description. As for our civic and social and community connections, the connections we have with our government have weakened. Even for governments who are delivering results, who are winning on the policy, they're still losing on the marketing. They're losing trust. There's us and there's them. And when we don't trust our institutions to deliver, we retreat further from our institutions themselves, from our leaders, and from each other. The fourth dilemma, and one which echoes and reinforces the others, is the changing way we interact with the media, or more realistically, the way the media interacts with us. Mark Latham's an Australian politician who nearly became Prime Minister as head of the centre-left Labour Party in 2004, but who ultimately lost to John Howard. Some argue that this handshake, captured in the election's final days, did him in, making him look more of a thug than a PM. And since 2004, Latham seems to have done everything possible to prove that this sentiment was, in fact, correct, alienating essentially all of his former colleagues, making a series of racist and homophobic comments so disgusting that by 2016, he'd been fired from a talk show on Sky News whose entire MO was controversial reactionary commentary. With that out of the way, Mark Latham was a very astute political commentator, one who correctly identified the changes rippling through the modern media landscape. Where once the media was, comparatively, capable of relatively neutral commentary on national policy, society and culture, Latham wrote that the new norm for the media has been one of generating manufactured outrage. The term manufactured outrage is a tip of the hat to two authors by the name of Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky, whose book Manufacturing Consent posits that the US mass media were not devoted to the delivery of meaningful news, but of propaganda, through the virtue of the market forces which make the delivery of propaganda, rather than news, more profitable. Chomsky and Herman argue that due to the comparative ease of generating and marketing partisan content, the risk of flack and the need to cater to owners and shareholders, legacy media has found that the soundest way to safeguard profits is to tow party lines rather than questioning them. Investigative journalism, which uncovers meaningful flaws and successes within society, is challenging to produce. Commentary on culture war issues, however, from Tucker Carlson to Alan Jones, from Piers Morgan to Ben Shapiro, is easier to produce and it's more popular. And as the viability of traditional mainstream media has narrowed, as the profits have shrunk and the layoffs have kicked in, the politics of outrage have moved from being a useful tool to a necessary one. And this is only to comment on legacy media. The new platforms, be it Elon's Sandpit or Meta or TikTok or YouTube, also rely on engagement to generate revenue. And for the exact same reasons, they also preference outrage over nuance. They don't even do it explicitly. They just leave it to the algorithm. And when the algorithm is good enough, it's far better than the editorial board. None of this incentivizes bipartisanship or reform or creativity. Instead, it contributes, in addition to the changes in our workplaces, in our communities, and in our politics themselves, to compound the isolation in our day-to-day -day lives. This would all be bad enough in itself, right? But in the isolation which emerges from these four dilemmas, the opportunity arises for some of the most bad faith actors in our midst to cash in. The increased detachment and inequality we've discussed, which in many cases is real and in many more cases is perceived, makes it easier to look at the economy and come to the conclusion that we're going to end up worse off than the generations who came before. It's possible for a lot of people that this really is how things are going to pan out too. The question though, is what to do about this? Do you improve the situation through the institutions we have, working out what should be preserved and working out individual components that can be replaced with something better? Individual changes within finance, within housing, within welfare and employment, with taxation and so on. Or do you go off the reservation? Do you decide that the existing institutions are inadequate and that the solution is to remove them, to drain the proverbial swamp? For some of those sufficiently alienated, this option is far more appealing. And there's a political class on both the left and right which seeks to harness this sentiment in full. Populism works by defining two groups in a society, the people and the elite and it assumes an antagonistic relationship between those two groups. This is consistent right across the political divide. 
Populists on both the left and right pit their supporters against the elite. They just define this elite, the enemy, differently. For the left, it's generally done in economic terms. The elite are the 1%. They're big business. They're the old guard. They're male, they're pale, and they're stale. For the poorer countries in the EU, the elites are the rich countries. For the young urban underclass of the US, they're the big businesses and banks who benefited from deregulation and laissez-faire. For the right, the only variation needed on this is to change the definition of the elite. Instead of the 1%, the elites are the academics, the brands making woke advertisements, and the politicians who preference the environment, immigrants, or social justice over the needs of the common people. For this group, the elite might not necessarily be the 1% who sit on the executive boards of major companies, but they are the university graduates who head up the HR departments of those companies. They're the inner city latte sippers, the champagne socialists, the multiculturalists, the postmodernists, and the secularists. Any of these groups could be the enemy. Any of them could be responsible for the decay and the inequality, be it real or perceived. At times, history has shown that these divisions can be leveraged for good. The revolution against the French monarchy, the US kicking out the British, the dismantling of apartheid in South Africa, Sometimes populist movements can work to create positive change, but that doesn't mean the populism of today is always a tool used by benevolent leaders to create positive change. In practice, it's more often an excuse to consolidate power, an excuse to kick back against the results of elections by saying they're rigged, to advocate that they should be given greater control over the levers of power so that they can break them down and rebuild them in your favour. This is a danger for developed democratic countries, one which has already actualized and has contributed to the democratic backslide we've seen over the past decade. The only possible justification for this should be that the leaders who weaponize these divisions have been able to actually deliver results. But the evidence that populists have provided us over the past decade is that essentially, every time you vote them in, they fuck everything up. Hungary, Brazil, and the US on the right need little introduction, but the left-wing populists in Bolivia and Mexico have enriched none more than the drug cartels operating in those countries. This is not worth the cost. Populist leaders emerge from division, but they do nothing to alleviate it. They harness and then perpetuate the breakdowns that caused our isolation, our division, and our anger. They depend on that isolation, division, and anger for their own survival. They seek to create a strong state, but they do so at the expense of society. I wouldn't say that I'm much of a conspiracy theorist. I think I'm generally pretty optimistic. I think that most people are genuine and good. I think there are lots of people out there who genuinely want to solve these issues through playing some small role within their community, however broadly or narrowly that community is defined. The unfortunate consequence of this belief, though, is that if there were easy solutions to these dilemmas, they would have been identified and enacted by now. Institutions are big, and our brains, at the individual level, are little. No amount of individual responsibility or protesting and definitely no amount of video essay making is going to be enough. I honestly don't know how we solve any of these four dilemmas, but I know we won't have a chance at all if we don't even bother to articulate what they are. That's the first step, and it's a shared responsibility between our leadership and ourselves. We want leaders brave enough to articulate these challenges clearly, rather than with riddles and leaks and hit pieces and other actions which undermine faith long term. Bonus points if you can articulate them without needing to find a common enemy to blame, be it the 1%, the immigrants, or the HR departments and the critical theory professors. If the legacy media don't want to play along with this, it's easier than ever to simply go around the legacy media. There are plenty of ways to get your message out now besides radio and television interviews. The technology that's created so much of this division, the social media and the smartphones, they can still be used to communicate directly and positively, to articulate why a decision is being taken, to build consensus. But the equally important responsibility lies with us, the individuals, to understand where these pressure points and challenges are coming from, and to think critically as well about where our information on them comes from about how we're receiving our media, and about whether that media is serving an ulterior purpose. This is how we actually get more smart people thinking about how to come up with genuine solutions to these dilemmas. And in the meantime, we can each play some small role in rebuilding the community and the social norms which have fallen by the wayside. If you like movies, books, music, property speculation, tobogganing, crypto speculation, bricklaying, sandcastles, hot air ballooning, grey lead pencil drawing, base jumping, walking, dogs, beer, cocktails, non-alcoholic cocktails, even golf, even golf, find something tolerable and then find a way to enjoy it with other people. If you really have no hobbies, join a union. If you do have hobbies, consider doing that anyway. Join a group, and if that group doesn't exist, go and create that group.
There's always excuses not to do this stuff, but let's be honest, most of those excuses, most of the time, are bullshit. It's very easy to look at the dilemmas discussed here, all of the challenges floating around in our economy and our society, and to discount individual action. Especially if you're coming at things from left of centre, it's easier to write off personal responsibility as some sort of macho lobster shit propagated by conservatives because they don't want you to turn your attention to the systemic issues, the inequality and injustice being cast on all of us by the powers that be. Similarly, it's very easy for those right of centre to make personal responsibility the be-all and end-all, and to dismiss any attempts at collective action or systemic reform as moralising or cynical power plays or quick paths to virtue. The suspicions around these actions on both the left and right have a grain of truth in them, but both of them are still necessary. A functioning liberal democracy needs two things to not collapse in on itself, a strong state and a strong society a strong state capable of meeting the demands of a modern society, and a strong society capable of keeping the state accountable, and ensuring that it continues to act in the public interest. The dilemmas we've discussed here show that a strong society is harder to maintain now than it was before, potentially harder than it ever has been. This places the strength of the state at risk, it leaves it vulnerable to hijacking by bad actors. And this occurs when we look around and we realise that we don't know each other the way we used to, because we now operate on so many different wavelengths. The only way forward is to find new ways to communicate across these wavelengths, and also to find the people in the gaps, who might struggle to do this without a bit of assistance. This is a taller ask than it used to be. It demands more active thought. We're more individualised now than we ever have been. More than any other time in history, we can do anything we want. We can be anything we want. But do we really know what we want? I certainly don't anymore. Maybe you do. 